this morning, I believe. Uh, we have some snow in Westminster already. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> I know that it's supposed to be starting over here around that time. I I started you all. I started the live stream. So if we're going to talk about Senator Hershey or delegate or Senator Eckert, let us know. So <laughs> Eastern Shore is supposed to get it later today. We're supposed to get it for about 12 hours. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is that bewitching hour of 9 a.m. If we could all please rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, yeah. Pledge of Allegiance to, to the flag of the United of States, United States, States of America and to the Republic for of which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. Uh, Senator Carosa, could you please uh, lead us in prayer? Thank you. I'd be happy to. As we gather this, as we I was gather just going to suggest everybody mute too. I'm sorry, Senator. Okay. As we gather this morning to do our work together on behalf of the people of the Eastern Shore, let us say a special prayer for safety and protection from the incoming snowstorm. We especially ask for your protection of all our roads workers, frontline emergency and public safety and health personnel. For all of us, please bless us with your wisdom and understanding to know your will and courage and right judgment to carry it out. And in closing, we turn to Psalm 25, verse four and five. Teach us your ways, O Lord, make them known to us. Teach us to live according to your truth, for you are our God who saves us. We trust in you, and together we say, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Senator. Um, I need to start off with, uh, first of all, I'd like to get an approval for the minutes. I need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Nice have it. Um, next, I think we got a special day here today. Um, for those of you that don't know this, it's all over Facebook, but uh, today is the great delegate Jay Jacobs' birthday. It's oh boy, happy birthday! Where's the donut with the candle? Well, actually, yesterday his um, his legislative aide, who's wonderful, Joanne, made a tremendously good carrot cake that we all enjoyed. And uh, but Jay, would you like to say something on your birthday? I mean, this is. Not a milestone, but it's getting there. Well, you know, uh, okay. I'm not as old as you, and I hope right. I never catch um. up with you. <laughs> First of all, and the carrot cake was wonderful. So, you um, know, it, it had three cups of Bugs Bunny eight. carrots in it. Correct. <laughs> well, thank it, you. It was for real, and I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed everyone that stopped by to got that fine. had a slice. And uh, my yeah. I, my phone is. Uh, lighting up this morning with well wishes and I can't tell everybody how much I appreciate it. even well, Ken Fender. He, he's even wishing me a happy birthday this morning. <laughs> of course, of course, Kenny's wishing you a happy birthday. It's what he does. <laughs> um, one, one last time before we get started, please, if you're not, not on the phone, Dina, could you mute your phone? I'm not calling out any names here, but could you please, everyone, please mute. Um, I'm not crazy, Susan. Okay, yes. thought I could have done that for. Okay, um, we'll get started here. Okay, first off, we have State Highway Administration, and um, well, I guess on my agenda, at least, we have uh, the world famous. <laughs> the Reverend Davis. <laughs> I mean, it's like, geez, did you see who they ran into? Kenny, are you starting us? Yes, Tim, do you want me to go ahead and take the lead or would you like to, sir? No, I, I, what I can do, uh, Delegate, is uh, I can start it off with a few remarks and then uh, we'll turn it over to questions and Jay and Ken are here to kind of help me with that. So if, if that's okay with you, sir. So uh, just, I guess, start off with good morning and then thank you for inviting me. Uh, for those that don't know me that well, uh, Tim Smith, Administrator for MDOT State Highway Administration. And uh, we were already kind of talking about it a little bit, but... Uh, I think over the past five years, it feels like maybe our, the, the, the Eastern shore has gotten our fair share of, uh, of storms and nor'easters and today is, is, is continuing that trend. Um, I kind of remember very vividly early January, 2017, uh, uh, driving down to talk to Jay uh, as we were in the middle of a, probably a 12 or 13 inch storm there in early January, 2017 in Salisbury and Cambridge. Uh, 
Uh, and if we've had a few of those big storms kind of target the eastern shore, and so uh, we'll, we'll, we are prepared for today as well. So uh, I think just in January so far, we've had several had several events kind of stack up on us, um, and some of those have been specifically on the eastern shore. Uh, we've had to deal with snow, sleet, freezing rain, uh, ice, and then uh, rain that turns to ice and some high winds. But uh, what's really important to me is our staff has just been working through the nights, weekends, holidays, last weekend um, to keep travelers safe. And so I, I'm just, I just want to kind of go on record to say how proud I am of our team uh, and how they've been providing, you know, safe roadways under less than ideal conditions and still trying to navigate through so our uh, state of emergency and some of our proper health practices uh, that we need to do. So uh, that's due to a, just the great team we have, but I give a lot of credit to the tremendous local leadership. We've already been talking about them. Is just our district engineers, uh, Ken Fender and, and Jay Meredith, who consistently make extremely wise decisions each and every day. Um, and I couldn't handle the statewide responsibilities without their wisdom and kind of support at the local level. Um, so uh, as a result of this storm, we're, Actually, the Hagerstown uh, area that's normally getting hit isn't isn't expected to get hit that bad. So we are giving Ken and Jay uh, some some additional resources for kind of redeploying those ahead of time. We did that last night, and I know they'll make continue to make wise decisions with those extra resources. So I'm going to prefer to talk about warmer weather because I'm already done with winter, even though we're only partially into it. Um, let's, but I want to talk about how opportunities we can kind of improve our roadway system. So I'm confident we can continue to provide kind of the expected level of service you have, have expected of us from highway operations, maintenance, construction. But yet, uh, I know our continued collaboration helps ensure we, we, we cover our, our blind spots and have a well-rounded perspective. So part of the responsibility of maintaining the road aid system is just taking good care of your infrastructure that has been entrusted to us. And so I just wanted to give you a couple quick stats. So in 2021, we were following our normal system preservation philosophy, which is trying to keep every our assets in good shape, um, both from a pavement and bridge standpoint. So we improved over 400 lane miles uh, in, of pavement across all the counties on the Eastern shore in 2021. And that included uh, repaving uh, uh, over 250 lane miles with new roadway surfaces. Uh, the other, the Delta there of 150, we did a lot of improvements in terms of system preservation strategies, whether that's crack sealing, patching, those type of things. So. And then I know uh, Delegate Jacobs, this was important to him, but just important to everyone on the Eastern Shore, especially on 301. Uh, on the bridge front, one example is we're opening bids on the 301 over the Chester River in March. Uh, we just recently advertised that project. That is currently the only bridge on the Eastern Shore in as a poor rated bridge. So we'll be addressing that later this year. So although it's critical and vital uh, to our infrastructure of pavement and bridges, it's just one part of the assets we're looking at, we're looking at traffic signals, lighting, traffic barriers. There's 70 other assets we need to mo um, monitor. And we're, we have a challenge there that we're trying to make sure we keep all those in good condition. So uh, just reminding everyone that we have a lot of other assets out there beyond just pavement and bridges. So uh, part of that, and, and one thing we're gonna be focusing more on in the future, I know Jay and Ken and I have both talked about this, is just our drainage infrastructure, especially uh, with, the areas in the Eastern Shore, we wanna make sure we get keep get those up to proper good condition, but keep them in the good condition. So pivoting in terms of just keeping traffic flowing on an existing footprint. Uh, I know a lot of folks know about our chart program and just how our, our, our folks are constantly patrolling, but uh, I wanted to just kind of emphasize that a little bit, just that we're, we have tactically deploy that, but also we were kind of proactively uh, patrolling all those areas. So. In 2021, um, our Eastern Shore Traffic Operations Team, which is kind of just focused on uh, that area, we responded to almost 2,700 incidents and events, and that's including US 50, uh, US 301, Maryland 404, Maryland 90. And that's because, like I said, we, we deployed some additional resources just during those times uh, that we have some high beach travel, but that we, we have, that's an area of focus for us all the time. Uh, in addition to that, I wanted to just talk real quickly about kind of our vision zero efforts to kind of limit fatalities on our roadways. Uh, we've made over 300 spot improvements across all our assets um, uh, over the past two years, kind of through that lens of the vision zero guide. And that's kind of started as a gra grassroots approach in 
I know Ken and Jay and the rest of the district engineers across the state, we've been talking about that. That's been mainly focused on improving existing pavement markings, improving signage, addressing uh, speed limits where it's appropriate, and, and making signal enhancements to help pedestrians and bicycles. A couple of good examples of that is just right there in Somerset County, we're, we're working on the next phase of the Maryland 413 shared use path. I know in Easton, uh, we, we, we were able to, 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 to coordinate and facilitate a rec and trails grant for them for the Easton Rail Trail. Um, and then I know Jay is working on that US 50 at Buckton Road signal, which has some pedestrian improvements. And Ken's working on uh, St. Michael's, the sidewalk improvements there. So what we're trying to do, like I said, is maintain our assets, uh, make sure we got folks moving and, and moving safely, and just looking at that vision zero effort. So we, I know we must proactively kind of look at all users on our roadway, whether they're on foot, bicycle, or motor vehicle. That's the really only way we can kind of get to a vision zero there uh, for the state for deaths. So uh, thanks for having me and, um, and Jay and Ken, and we're happy to answer any questions or discuss any concerns you might have. Thank you. Um, are they going to speak? Kenny, you ready now? Yes, sir. I got a few things I just want to bring up with the district. Uh, district 2 is involved with currently. Um, kind of break it down into a couple different sections. Our traffic section, uh, we're working on several different access management permits. Uh, one of the bigger ones we've got going on right now is in Talbot County. Uh, it's the lakeside development. Um, they're planning on having phase one open up June of this year. Uh, it's going to be a huge development. It's going to take several years to get this thing totally opened up. But uh, it's a multi-phase project. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 200, or, sorry, yeah, 200, 2,500 mixed use uh, units that are going to be out of there. So phase one will be opened up uh, this June. Uh, the intent is to have phase one completed within a year or two. So after that phase is completed, uh, we'll do another evaluation about a signal, whether or not a signal is warranted at that location. Uh, we've got several uh, access management permits in Cecil County that we're working on. Some of them are rather large as well. One of the biggest ones up there is the Southfields development. Uh, we're working closely with that to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're getting everything approved, the permits in place, and and keeping that project moving as well. So permit, the phase one permit has been issued for Southfields. Um, also have another Bainbridge, another development Bainbridge up in Port Posit. That one is, is another pretty good size development as well. Uh, we've had revised plans submitted and we should be able to issue the permit based on those submittals recently. So uh, moving to our construction section, uh, we're wrapping up on several projects throughout the district. Uh, one of them is Maryland 273, the bridge replacement in Fair Hill. Uh, we have a few small punch list items that we need to address with that. Uh, Maryland 272 bridge northeast at Ram Track. Same thing with that. We're working on some punch list items. Uh, 272 at Route 40, the geometric improvements uh, at the location. We finally got them paved. Uh, that intersection opened up, but we also have some punch list items that we're going to need to work on as well. So uh, we're completing the project in Millington. Uh, that's been a long-standing wish for the town, so we're in the process of finalizing that as well. And again, it has a few punch list items we need to follow up with this, on that project. So, as Tim mentioned, we have the sidewalk project going on in, in St. Michael's. Uh, we continue to work with the community to make sure that we're uh, impacting or minimizing any impact standard to the town because it's, you know, we all know that's a very touchy area down there. They've got a lot of uh, community uh, activities going on, so we're working with them to provide uh, you know, all day schedules and, and keep things moving with them too as well. So, Touch a little bit on our system preservation that Tim also mentioned. Uh, we've got a total based on FY22, starting in FY22 to FY23, we've allocated $37 million uh, throughout the entire district. So we've got everything milling, uh, milling overlay projects, uh, other system preservations, crack sealing, uh, microservicing projects uh, scheduled for the upcoming uh, FYs. Uh, so we do, I do have an itemized list that's very long and I'd rather not go over each individual location, but I'd be happy to share that with you as well. 
Uh, we're still finalizing some of the locations, but uh, I, I think we've got a pretty good handle on that. So we're we're preparing for uh, you know some upcoming hopefully uh, budget increases with some of the stimulus, but we're waiting to see that come through. So we do have self shelf projects uh, that we are able to roll out at that if if and when it does come out. So I think that covers uh, anything for District Two. Again, we're preparing for this pending storm coming in, so you guys stay safe. And I just want to say I appreciate the prayers and thoughts for District 1 and District 2 for our staff. I don't think people realize a lot of times what these guys, these ladies and gentlemen, have to deal with. It's it's not an easy job. Jay and I both have been out there during these storms ourselves, and uh, we know what they have to deal with. So we appreciate the thoughts and concerns. So we'll definitely pass that on, but I think it wraps it up for District 2. Thanks, Kenny. I, I'm going to reiterate, too, as well as Kenny just said about uh, your, everybody's thoughts and prayers, because this is going to potentially be a very significant event with the high winds, blizzard conditions. Um, so, um, you know, try to be conscious of that, particularly with your um, in your districts with folks that you talk to. Just try to keep everybody home, you know, when you when you're out and, and speaking with them. Um, as far as projects, um, I'm just going to stick to the format. If you all have any questions about any particular projects, um, you know, we just had CTP and I interact with you guys so frequently that, um, you know, if you have any questions about any particular projects that we may have coming up um, or anything that's special to you, just ask, feel free. Um, and with that, I'm just going to turn it back over to you for, for that opportunity of anything you may you may have uh, or need information about. Good. All right. Thank you. Um, do I have any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Delegate Hughes. Okay. Actually, uh, Delegate, yes, Delegate Hughes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, certainly uh, for your hard work. And uh, what I really am appreciative of is the proactiveness um, in making sure our roadways are in good working order, especially during this period of time. Um, and, you know, traveling the state and just, you know, get the chance to often look at our roadways and, and how things are kept up versus in some other states, they're not as so great. So I certainly am appreciate, appreciative of your leadership. Mine's just a real quick one. It's a project that um, in Cambridge, uh, it's a street signage one. I might uh, just needed some follow up with on that one. It was um, put in by Commissioner uh, Cephas, Buddy Cephas over in city of Cambridge uh, to honor um, Janelle Buck. Henry, a former owner of the funeral home, and he had been working with um, Tyson Brine, the regional planning manager. Um, and so that project's a little, um, I don't know, delayed or whatever. I just need to know the status. So if you could follow up that issue or that project with me, um, contact my office and see what we might need to do to con that moving forward. I'll absolutely do that. I'll reach out and find out. I'm not familiar with that particular um, sign dedication request, but I will find out about that and follow back up with your office. Okay. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have uh, Delegate Jay Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Tim Smith for the, uh, the, the accurate, speed and accuracy, which he, they've addressed that 301 bridge project. Uh, I know it's very concerning to some of us. It's on the Queen Anne's King County border, and it's it's a bridge that's, you know, if something happened to it, it would really affect the lifeblood of moving moving traffic around in their district. So I really appreciate your uh, getting on that one right away. And uh, next, I wanted to reach out to the Ken Fender Fan Club again and thank him for. Uh, for the work in Millington, I know it's been a heck of a project, and and I know there's a couple things left that we'll talk about. Some of that, I'll I'll call you personally about it, but I also want to thank you for the 445 project. Um, finally getting that drainage issue fixed. I know that the commissioners were were making that sort of their priority, and uh, I was glad to get that done. I've heard some. Uh. Are you done, Delegate? I think he fell off. 
Yeah, you uh, he was. He muted himself. Now, I think he's there. Jay, are you still there? You're you're muted, Jay. Wonderful. So now I'm not muted, right? Now you're not muted. All right, I'm finished. Thank you. Okay. You know, I, I you, uh, we do have another uh, question, uh, Mr. Walton. Um, typically, we don't uh, entertain questions, but do you have a quick question you wanted to ask? Yes, I'm Larry Walton. I'm with ARP on Eastern Shore. My quick question is, if I see anything glaring, everybody's kidding about the phone number. What phone number will we call? Call, call your delegate. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. I, that, would, I can. that would probably be the best answer for you. Um, I don't know. Is there, is there a main number they can call, Tim? I can call Wayne. I was going to say, Larry, use another number. If I see your name show up, I don't know. I know. To answer it. <laughs> Tim, is there a number you could give us, a, a, a broad number for information? I Well, we, we typically uh, direct folks, uh, if, if it's if it's an emergency, you should you should follow that path. Um, I don't know. Jay or Ken, do you know the number off the top of your head with one the 1-800 yeah, number? Yeah, I'll give you. So if, if, if you have anything for District 1, which is the lower counties, um, Dorchester, Wicomico, Western Somerset, <laughs> Just call our main office, which is 410-677-4000. And then um, you'll be directed from there, depending on the, you know, the type of call or request that you have. Thank you. I'll just call Wayne three o'clock in the morning. Perfect. I, Thanks, I can also you give you, I can also give you a number as well, if you like, for district two. It's a uh, line if he's into my office. 410-778. Three zero six one. That's the line directly to the district office. And if you have any questions, that this like they said, we can go the verge to whoever needs to find an answer or, or update for you. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we have Senator Eckert. Thank you very much. Just adding my two cents, and for everybody on the call, those district offices are very responsive. Um, I've had just. You know, they're just responsive. That's all I can say. So don't hesitate to call them. Thank you. I, I, don't, so. <laughs> I don't see other questions, but I just want to make the comment. I, I Tim, I, I'm sure you'll appreciate this. And and, and, and Kenny, you and Jim, I, I think we get tremendous response in our districts. Uh, and I can't tell you how much we all appreciate it, because I know when I have a constituent issue, I, I can get a hold of somebody quickly. I get some resolve on it. Um, we all know that sometimes questions are asked that the answers might take a little bit of time, but I, I can't say enough good about the guys that uh, respond to my office in particular, and I'm sure most of us would agree. I just want to, that's kudos for you all, but uh, that seems to be a love fest every time we meet with you. We're yeah. very lucky. And thank you. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you. We appreciate the love. Thank you. <laughs> okay um you know what the good news is we're a couple minutes ahead of schedule i got to get a haircut so that makes my day a little better um if we, <laughs> if we well, that's okay uh, thanks delegate senator okay i guess moving right along um do we have uh mr doyle william doyle from the ports is he is he with us good morning I think this is working. Sorry, we're down to one laptop for today, so it'll just be me passing it around, but I will pass it to MPA Executive Director. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, good morning. It's my second time with you. My name is uh, Bill Doyle, and I'm the Executive Director for the Port of Baltimore. And I want to pass along, um, you know, thoughts and prayers that everybody gets through. The winter storm that's coming, um, and that uh, all the best to our first responders and all you folks stay safe. Um, so a lot, a lot of things. Right, right. I thought I recognized that voice. So I looked up. And I said, oh. Excuse me. Is that okay? okay. Um, a lot of things have happened since last year, um, especially with relation to the Eastern Shore. Um, you know, Congressman Andy Harris. Um, Senator Van Hollen and Senator Cotton, um, and you know, basically the entire congressional delegation really came through. And they were able to secure uh, $37.5 million 
and the latest budget for Mid Bay Islands, and then um, you know some extra um, couple of million dollars for Slaughter Creek and Northeast River, and um, you know those things are you know to get those in the hopper and ready to go uh, is very important. And I know they worked hard in the congressional delegation. So um, for the Port of Baltimore and for the Eastern Shore and the Chesapeake Bay, this is a this is a big development. It's important, and uh, we really do need it. Um, yesterday, we had the new um, Assistant Secretary for the Army Civil Works, Michael Connor, uh, visit the port. He came with um, uh, the second in command, Commanding General of the Army Corps of Engineers, Butch Graham. He also came with the New York uh, Major General, Tom Tickna, and we had Colonel S.D. Pinchazen. She is our Colonel here at the Baltimore District. And we took him for a tour uh, of the port, both the water side uh, and the land side uh, tour of the port. And then we spent the next two hours talking about the um, you know, Mid-Bay Islands and uh, you know, the Chesapeake. And we also discussed the fact that you know, now that Mid-Bay uh, is going to move forward and that the Northeast River and Slaughter Creek uh, are on the table, that um, there will be more requests for, you know, shallow draft type dredging uh, in the Chesapeake, uh, you know, Bay Bridge and below. Um, I want to say that things are going very well here in the port. We're seeing more and more ships come into the Port of Baltimore that do not ordinarily uh, exist on a schedule uh, to the port. And I can give you an interesting um, you know, tidbit fact is that there's so much going on right now with supply chain and congestion that you know, 35 miles from the Port of Baltimore is Starbucks largest roasting facility and their world's largest distribution center. And we get the green bean coffee for like Pike's Roast uh, from South America. And the ship schedule has been all over the place um, on trying to get um, products, goods, retail items on ships. So what Starbucks did is, and this is unheard of, this is, this is something that we're seeing more and more of, but nobody would have believed this, these kind of things would happen. Um, Two years ago, they went out and chartered their own ship. So Starbucks rented their own ship to get their coffee beans from South America into the port of Baltimore. Um, and that roaster in Southern York County, Pennsylvania, um, roasts about 3 million uh, pounds of coffee a week. And they were running low. And so they rented their own ship and 450 TEU of containers are being unloaded right now as we speak. So that's what we see uh, going on in the Port of Baltimore. Uh, we see a lot uh, more ships coming in. Uh, we are the least congested port on the East Coast. Um, I would say that we're probably the least congested major port in the United States of America. And also um, with the Howard Street Tunnel, we'll have the Howard Street Tunnel that we broke ground on in December. And the important piece on that is that will open up the Port of Baltimore's access into the Ohio Valley, Great Lakes region, Chicago distribution network uh, for all cargo coming in. So we'll have the local cargo, and you know that we built all these distribution um, centers, um, meaning Amazon, Home Depot, Florin Decor, Wayfair, the furniture market that will come from you know Southeast Asia, Vietnam area. They have broke ground. They're going to be building a distribution center, and on and on and on that we're seeing. So from an economic standpoint, we're doing very well. Um, I will take questions. Uh, if you have questions uh, after we're done, I have Kristen Fidler here with me. Um, you probably all know her, she's phenomenal. She runs the Harbor Development um, piece of the Maryland Port Administration Port of Baltimore. And what I'll do is I'm gonna hand over the computer to her and then she'll give um, an update on uh, basically everything dredging in Chesapeake Bay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Great to see everyone. Again, Kristen Fidler here with MPA, and I serve as the director of the Office of Harbor Development. 
if you'll bear with me for one second, I'm going to try sharing my screen. I've got a couple of slides to walk through with you today. Oh, post disabled participant screen share. If you could speak up a little too, it's hard yeah. hearing you. Absolutely, I will. I will project uh, louder. Is there a way that I can share my screen to um, both of my slides? You should be able to. We have a, allowed you to. Okay. Could enable screen sharing if you haven't already. That seems to be what the disconnect is. I thought we had did that. Um, Thanks, delegate. I'm, I'm working on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Okay, how about now? Okay, let me try one second. It looks like you are sharing your Yeah, I know. Screen. I better stop that. <laughs> 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 Don't want that out there. <laughs> I thought I just did that. I'm sorry. No, I, thank you. I apologize. Uh, any luck yet? I think you might still be sharing. Uh, yeah, I, might be, I thought we had covered that. I apologize. Let me just try it again. I'll get back. And Delegate Aarons, I, I, oh, let's see. Let me try. Oh, there we go. We're good. Hang on one second. It's up. Okay, I'm great. Working. Thank you, Senator Eckert. Um, okay, great. So we'll jump right in. Um, I thought I'd start this morning by providing just a little bit of context as to the importance of the Mid Bay project to the yes. overall sort of the Maryland Department of Transportation, Maryland Port Administration, or the MPA is responsible for the waterborne commerce through the state of Maryland. So the overall success of the port in today's highly competitive trade environment is absolutely dependent on providing safe and reliable access for these ultra large vessels via deep and well-maintained channels. We are so fortunate to have a 50 foot channel system leading to the port of Baltimore, and it truly is our marine highway. As you all well know, we partner with the Army Corps of Engineers to perform the maintenance dredging of our marine highway through that regular uh, annual dredging cycle. Focusing just on the bay channel segments of our entire navigation channel system, I want to, to fe feature just briefly a hugely successful example of the beneficial use of dredge material, and that is the Poplar Island Project, which I'm confident many of you have visited firsthand, and if you haven't yet or recently, we would welcome the chance to take you back out there to see this incredible world-class example of, of how to reuse this valuable resource that is dredge material. So again, Poplar is a collaborative project between MPA and the Army Corps of Engineers. It has been the main recipient of about 2 million cubic yards of material every year removed from the Bay Channel segments. Um, it has been that main recipient for the last 20 years and will continue to receive dredge material for about 10 more years. The project has used dredge material to rebuild what was a heavily eroded island. It had eroded down to less than 10 acres back in the 90s and has been restored to 1,715 acres of remote island habitat that is both diverse and thriving. It includes high and low marsh wetlands, uplands, and an open water habitat feature that all of which are now home to hundreds of species of wildlife and waterfowl, including the diamondback terrapin and the state-listed endangered common terns. 
Um, just as a quick status update on the project, construction of the perimeter footprint of the expansion cells was completed just about a year ago, January of 21, and inflow of 2.2 million cubic yards from the Bay Channel segment of the channel system was inflowed into those expansion cells in April of 2021. That expansion portion provides an additional 28.9 million cubic yards of capacity and again allows that additional 10 years for Poplar Island before it reaches maximum capacity. Diverse wildlife habitat development continues and to date there are eight wetland cells or 312 acres that have been developed upon full completion of the project, there will be 776 acres of wetlands, 829 acres of, of uplands, and as I mentioned, that 110 acre of open water embayment um, that will be provided for the, the benefit of the Chesapeake Bay. I also just want to quickly mention, you're seeing a picture of this baby terrapin hatchling um, in the top left of the screen. That we're entering the 17th year of our Terrapin Education and Research Program, or TERP, um, where baby terrapin hatchlings are placed in classrooms around the state of Maryland to be raised by students. It's, we call it the Head Start Program because these baby terrapins are given um, a significantly greater chance of survival with the care and feeding and, and love and comfort of that first year in a classroom. And then the students return to Poplar Island at the end of the school year and release the, the baby terrapins back out onto the beaches of Poplar. Um, and they're able to participate in real life data collection and research. So over the last 16 years, 2,800 terrapins have received a head start at life um, from these students and 750 classrooms around Maryland have participated. So, when Poplar Island reaches capacity, again, estimated in about 2032, we will be looking to Mid-Bay, the Mid-Bay Island Ecosystem Restoration Project to receive the annual inflow of 2 million cubic yards of clean Maryland Bay channel material that Poplar currently receives. The absolute success, lessons learned, adaptive management, and the partnership between MPA and the Corps of Engineers will serve as our roadmap for delivering a successful mid-bay project. So just a couple of quick stats here on the slide, you can see that the mid-bay project is comprised of both Barron Island and James Island. It was authorized by Congress in 2014. It too is a cost shared project between MPA and the Corps. Um, it will provide 90 to 95 million cubic yards of total capacity so that is over 30 years, um, which is absolutely unheard of when you think about dredge material management solutions. That is a long-term sustainable opportunity that is just absolutely incredible. Um, and most importantly, and, and a point of great excitement and pride that is hot off the press, is that through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was released last week, the Army Corps of Engineers received $37.5 million to start construction of the Mid-Bay project this year. That is the first slug of money that was desperately needed on the federal side to keep this project moving forward, to keep it moving forward on time and on budget. So that is a huge hurdle that we have just cleared. So getting into a little bit more of the specifics of the project, Barren Island, which is the smaller piece and which will start the project, will start with Barren Island restoration. That includes the installation of sills and a breakwater to protect the currently existing island remnants and the SAV beds. SAV is subaquatic vegetation, really important seagrass for water quality and other um, aquatic ecosystem benefits for the Chesapeake Bay. And we will also restore 72 acres of remote island habitat through the restoration of wetlands. The dredge material that will be the source of sediment for that wetland restoration is to come from the local shallow draft navigation channels of Honga River um, and, and nearby, so Honga and Tar Bay, I believe. 
The James Island portion of the project is the, the massive sort of Poplar Island 2.0, and that is 2,072 acres of remote island habitat that will be restored. It will be a mix of wetlands and uplands. It'll be 55% wetlands, 45% upland habitat. And that will um, start construction, we anticipate, in 2024. So I'll get into the, the timeline in a few slides. So just to give you a sense of the economic benefits of a massive construction project like Midbay, the Midbay project by itself will create 550 jobs in Maryland during the 30 plus year construction effort it will generate three and a half billion dollars in economic activity. This is separate from and in addition to the economic activity that the Port of Baltimore generates on its own through the import and export of maritime commerce. Um, and like I said previously, it provides over 30 years of dredge material placement capacity. This is so critical. It's such an important signal to send to our customers who are looking to sign 30, 40, 50 year contracts with the Port of Baltimore to know with certainty that we will be maintaining that 50 foot deep channel system for the duration. So talking a little bit more about the environmental benefits of a project like this, um, we've talked about the restoration 2,144 acres in total of remote island habitat and this includes over a thousand acres of tidal wetlands. This is really important in the Chesapeake Bay as remote island habitat is incredibly scarce and rapidly eroding to, you know, over the years and, and certainly today. Between 1992 and 2010, the Chesapeake Bay lost 1,566 acres of tidal wetlands. Um, over the last 150 years, over 10,000 acres of remote island habitat has been lost in the middle eastern portion of the bay alone. So bringing back this scarce remote island habitat is critical for the diversity and success of wildlife that call the Chesapeake Bay, which is such an incredibly biodiverse ecosystem um, that they call home. We are also preserving the existing island remnants and their habitats. We're sustaining those existing seagrass beds at Barren Island. And again, that promotes conditions for additional seagrass beds to grow and thrive. We're enhancing that diverse wildlife habitat for avian and recreationally and commercially important fish species. So really important to the watermen and water women who rely on the health of that bay um, and its species for their livelihood and significantly reducing erosion to local shorelines by decreasing wave heights and wave velocity. So we'll get into a little bit more of those specifics um, in a minute. From a national perspective, again, looking at the Chesapeake Bay as one of the nation's largest estuarine ecosystems and one of the world's most biologically productive estuaries, um, the Chesapeake Bay also serves as part of the national flyway for avian species um, and is just so critically important to so many different aquatic species. So looking at Barren Island, we have the final design for the Barren Island restoration in hand. And so with that, we are able to quantify and monetize what the immediate benefits and impacts of constructing this project will look like. So we've created this infographic that if you don't already have it, we're happy to send you a copy and share with your constituents. But this talks about how your residents, neighbors, citizens, constituents will directly benefit from the immediate construction of just the Barren Island portion of the project. So over the next 10 years, folks in Dorchester County can expect up to 30% reduction in the storm-related shoreline erosion rate on Upper Hoopers Island and in the area north of Fishing Creek, a million dollars in property value benefits due to reduced wave energy, improved water quality, and other effects of protecting that subaquatic vegetation or those seagrass beds. 
$1.5 million in enhanced boating, fishing, and wildlife watching experiences. And you can see the rest, three new bird nesting islands. We've talked about the new acres of wetlands and seagrass. So again, we will do this same sort of analysis, economic impact assessment, when we have the 100% design for James Island. That is currently getting started. Um, and we'll have that over the next year to two years. Um, and you can imagine if Barren Island is only 72 acres in size and we have this kind of direct result in terms of benefits, just imagine what 2,000 acres of James Island and that shoreline protection um, is going to provide for your, your neighbors and, and constituents. We're looking forward to doing that analysis. So next steps with Barren Island, we are um, we're looking forward to completing the permitting piece for the project. Um, we expect to receive the water quality certificate in about April of this year. The environmental assessment and the public review is wrapping up this month. Um, we expect the NEPA document to be issued in possibly March of this year. 100% um, design will be fully finalized in probably June, followed shortly thereafter with awarding of the first construction contract and construction beginning in about September of 2022. And I just wanted to mention, um, we are doing our absolute best. I'm sure there is room for improvement and I absolutely welcome feedback and suggestions. Given the virtual world that we're living in, um, we, are, we are trying to get down to Dorchester County as frequently as we can, but also connect with citizens and stakeholders um, through snail mail, email, website, as much as possible. We wanna share progress on the project uh, regularly, but we absolutely wanna get feedback and input along the way. A couple of resources for you to, to share widely are listed here. We have a great webinar about the project. Uh, we have snail mail and email newsletters that you can subscribe for. Um, we held an open house meeting back in November down at the fire hall. We look forward to doing that again um, several times this year and thereafter. We are coordinating across various agencies at the state and federal level. Um, to prioritize funding for those nearby shallow draft dredging projects. We recognize the importance that those serve to the citizens in the area. And we're also working across agencies um, through the formation of a resiliency working group to identify how we can maximize and truly ensure that this world-class project brings the utmost benefits from a resiliency standpoint that it possibly can. So we're availing ourselves of the, the latest and greatest technology and expertise on engineering with nature, nature-based solutions and things of that um, so that we can ensure we deliver the best project possible with the most benefits for all of the citizens of Maryland. And that was my last slide. I see several hands up. I'm happy to take questions. I apologize if I'm shouting. I hope you can hear me. You're, you're not shouting. It was, it was difficult for the most part. But you, I mean, you did a great job after we got it open. But thank you very much for getting closer. Um, I think first up, we have uh, Delegate Jay Jacobs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I got a question for Mr. Doyle, okay. if he's still around. Okay. Um, is uh, Mr. Doyle there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I know you're playing musical chairs there. So um, I wanted to ask you a question about cargo. Um, I mean, you know, we see a lot on the news and hear a lot on the news about ports that are backed up, in, especially in California, that they got ships stacked up out there. And, and uh, I've heard that some some ships have been diverted to Baltimore to get unloaded faster. So I'm, I'm kind of curious as to where Baltimore is in, in the whole uh, issue of this backlog of goods being unloaded. You know, I was always impressed uh, by the speed in, in which Baltimore was unloading these ships, especially mega ships. And I'm just wondering if, 
if it's true that some ships have been diverted to Baltimore and, and, and you know, what, what your conditions are as far as, as uh, the unloading of cargo. Yeah, that, um, thank you very much, sir. Um, we're doing very well on the diverted ships cargo since if, if we were to take a drop point of August 2020 um, during COVID, uh, we've had over 40 ships, that's four zero ships, uh, diverted to the Port of Baltimore that were destined um, for other ports. And the reason why they were diverted to the Port of Baltimore is just like you said, the, the, the fact that we can get the cargo and containers into the stream of commerce uh, quickly. Um, the longshoremen do a great job, you know, unloading and loading the ships. Um, so that has been a significant uh, piece. We've also attracted two new services. So those, those 40 ships, they're called ad hoc. Ad hoc means that they are ships that would have otherwise been um, going to another port, diverted to the Port of Baltimore. We also had two new dedicated services. So we have a 13 ship string. Um, that one starts in uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, through the Panama Canal into the Port of Baltimore. The other, and that's with uh, Maersk Line Limited. Um, the other um, service um, is with uh, Mediterranean Shipping Company. That service starts in India. Um, hits several ports on the Europe side of the Mediterranean. So it goes through the Suez Canal, ports in the Mediterranean, and then into the Baltimore, uh, Port of Baltimore. So those are dedicated weekly services. So we're seeing that now, um, uh, you know, and, and a big part of that is the infrastructure that we have here. Um, and when I say the infrastructure, it's also what the private sector does itself, uh, off port, not on the dock necessarily, but off port. That's your distribution, fulfillment, sorting centers that we have uh, in and around both Trade Point Atlantic uh, and in the counties surrounding uh, Baltimore. So that's a big that's a big piece of what's going on here. And I'll also give you another one: uh, automobiles. So on the automobile side, uh, Baltimore remains and continues to be the largest importer and exporter of automobiles in the United States of America. And in December, uh, before Christmas, I think it was around the 10th of December, um, we got a call from Mercedes-Benz. And Mercedes-Benz was sending a ship. It was coming across the Atlantic. They were going to do a stop in Baltimore um, to unload somewhere in the range of 1,100 Mercedes. After they, came, after they would drop off in Baltimore, they would head through the Panama Canal and into Los Angeles, Long Beach. They couldn't get a window, they couldn't get a berth um, in Los Angeles, Long Beach. So they called the port. Uh, we got a hold of Ports America, Chesapeake, and said, look, they, the ship that's coming over needs to drop an additional 600 Mercedes Benz in the Port of Baltimore. Uh, can we do it? Oh, well, you know, in a situation like that, the answer is never no. Um, so, um, you know, we said, yes, we can do it. Um, and then we called, you know, I, I got on the phone with the president of the uh, Longshoremen's Association, ILA uh, Union, um, Scott Cowan, and said, you know, Scott, listen, we got, we got the ship coming in. We got an additional 600. Um, no questions asked. A team's there. Monday morning, we'll get it done in 24 hours. So um, the ship came in. We unloaded the 1,600 Mercedes, 16, 1,700 Mercedes. And, you know, timing is everything. And it just happened to be that we were, we were mid-stroke negotiations with Mercedes-Benz, um, asking them, negotiating with them to remain in the Port of Baltimore. Uh, and by the 30th of uh, December, three weeks later, um, we got a 20-year contract. So we got a 20 additional 20 year contract with Mercedes Benz. Um, they were looking around the country to see if they were going to, you know, perhaps put in another, um, what you call, um, you know, vehicle service center. And um, they like Baltimore. They like what we do here. They like our workforce and they remain for another 20 years. So, um, you know, Delegate Jacobs, that's just a snapshot of what goes on. I mean, there's things going on here every day in the port. 
Um, and that's not even talking about the exports that we send out of here. Um, we don't necessarily export air, meaning nothing. Um, off the West Coast, it, there's a lot of empty containers and waste paper. Here in Baltimore, we get the products from the Midwest, Case New Holland manufactured goods, Caterpillar manufactured goods, and um, um, other, you know, farming machinery, John Deere, uh, and the rest. They all come through the Port of Baltimore. So I think that answers your question. Um, it, it's 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 exciting, and, and we're doing the best we can. And we got, you know, it's not it's not the ending. It's the beginning of a lot of things because we're going to keep going. I appreciate that. I think you gave a, a very a very good answer. And uh, you know, I'd heard that I'd heard what but that's what Baltimore was doing, but I just wanted to verify it. And I appreciate very much, uh, you know, what you're doing. And congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, next up, we have Senator Eckhart. Thank you very much. And to the port team, God bless you. And thank you. I had the opportunity to go up to Trade Point on a site visit, and I was just astounded with the redevelopment there. So, I mean, this has been building over years um, from back, you know, in the 90s. So God bless you. And thank you, Kristen. Thank you for your good work. And again, to the team, I know Joe um, Coyne and Bruce Coulson appreciate this because it's been a 25 to 30 year journey getting the Mid Bay Islands project going. And it was originally designed and thought of to be able to protect the shoreline. So to deal with the, the action of the waves there. So that's um, very impressive. You've been responsive to all of us. And I know when we had the meeting down at, um, at Madison that you were working with the watermen. And I think that's going to be really, really important so that we don't disturb um, the, the routine and the fisheries um, activity that is going on. So keep us in that loop if you don't mind, because I know we have um, a lot of um, fisheries activities that are going on and will continue to go on and expand in the future. Absolutely, we will do. Thank you for your support and for the feedback. And yes, we are, um, we need that direct line of communication with the watermen. They are providing, I mean, they know the area and the, the river bottom better than anybody. So, you know, that insight is critical to us getting this right and, and working together to do so. So yes, thank you. And we will continue to work with them and, and keep you informed. Yeah, are you, do you already have direct contacts from that meeting that you're following up with? Yes, we absolutely do. Great, great, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, next up, we have Delegate Adams. And, and I'll be really quick, uh, Chairman. Uh, Senator Eckhart covered almost everything I was gonna say, which was, Thank you for the direct communication. I've uh, had a few phone calls myself with uh, constituents who I know are working uh, directly with the uh, administration. And I, the only purpose for me even talking right now is to just validate the, the fact that you're considering stakeholder outreach as being very important, which I, number one, agree with, and number two, can validate that you're doing that. And thank you so much for that, because it, it is so important uh, for the outcome here. Thank, thank you, Delegate. Absolutely. We concur. And, um, you know, we can't wait to just be able to be fully present more frequently, you know, um, but we're weathering the COVID storm, so to speak. And um, we, we just really look forward to ramping up the, the efforts that we already have in place. Uh, and, um, I think our, maybe our final question, I might have a quick one for you, Delegate Mouse. Um, oh, thanks, Chairman. Um, and I want to uh, follow up on all the, the praise and accolades. Um, it, that's wonderful news. Um, the uh, PowerPoint that you provided was very good. Uh, can you forward that to our offices just so we have it? I know, I know you've got the newsletters and things like that, but that can be information overload. Yeah. Um, and then you also provided a little summary um, in your introduction about different funding and things like that. You know, the, the federal funds that we got for dredging and stuff like those, those different items. If you could include that just to keep us up to up to speed on on where we're going, 
that'd be very helpful because that project's moving quickly and it's a big, it's a big one. And I know they, it, it'll probably change many times and we're really happy about it. Um, I, I had a question though about Poplar Island and um, when is Poplar Island done? What is the work plan for that? Is that, you know, in the, at some point, is there an end point where the work stops or will there be continual maintenance for, uh, for, for the future? That's a, a great question. And there's, you know, sort of different definitions of, of done or complete. So when we talked about the perimeter construction of the expansion cell being complete last year, you know, that was a huge milestone, but it is by no means, you know, the end, the end of the project. It was just the outside perimeter. So that has about 10 more years of filling it in with dredge material. So mm -hmm. that takes 2032 but to your point 10 plus years even beyond that of ongoing um wetland cell development and upland habitat mm -hmm. development will need to to continue so Good. i i don't know that we'll actually be you know totally wrapped up at poplar until sometime in the 2040s right and then that really begs the question of what do we, how does this resource continue to serve the maximum public interest? So right now we offer free tours to the public um, about seven months of the year for folks to go out and see Poplar and learn about the history and learn about the partnership and all of the various wildlife that are out there. Um, can we continue to do that? And is it in, you know, is that the Maryland Port Administration's role to do that, or is it a different agency or a different entity that makes more sense? Um, so those are questions that we'll have to start grappling with here sooner than later. Um, but yeah, I would say we probably have another 20 years of boots on the ground, development of the, the habitat and maintaining it so that it is successful and, and built for long-term success. Yeah, well, that's great to hear. I should have just been up front and said, you know, I hope this project is not something you put a stamp on and say that it's done. And I think um, from my experience um, that there is a long-term um, uh, investment beyond just what we're doing as far as like the dredge spoil. And, um, and I think there's a lot that can be uh, utilized from the investment um, and, uh, and that it, that will carry on if we can, you know, I know we're kind of finding our way with pop, Poplar, but once the Poplar model gets set, you know, maybe in Midbay, there may be another, another model because of the, just the location. I mean, they're just incredible locations. You, it's, it's just amazing when you're, when you're there and, and Midbay is even going to be more amazing um, the further you go down the bay. So I appreciate you sharing the, um, um, the slides and the information. It's great to see you give our best to everybody at the port. And uh, thank you again. Right, thank you. Thank you, Delegate Miles. I think we're running a little bit over here. Uh, Krista, I want to thank you. I do have an offline question for you about some other islands and what have you, but I'll address that with you after we're done with this meeting. Um, I apologize, we're a couple minutes late. I think we're coming up next on Jamie Hayes from Junior Achievement. Jamie, are you ready? Yes, yes, thank you so much. Um, first off, thank you to the chair, Delegate Ahrens for having Junior Achievement here and to our Lower Shore delegation and senators for all your support of this vital, vital project for the shore and um, we appreciate you. We are beyond thrilled that Governor Hogan has put a $1 million uh, line item for junior achievement in this project in his capital budget. The Purdue Henson Junior Achievement Center is a 27,000 square foot financial literacy and workforce development center that will serve six counties in Maryland, Caroline Talbot, Dorchester, Wacomico, Worcester, and Somerset counties, and educate more than 10,000 students. And as many of you may or may not know, um, there are three of these already in Maryland, in Montgomery, PG, and Baltimore, and they are seeing some amazing results. So we're ready for it to be here on the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, and I know many of you have been uh, supportive of this project. 
uh, Delegate Carl Anderton, as well as Senator Carroza, and our chamber president, as well as our chairman, Mike Dunn, who's the president and CEO from the Greater Salisbury Committee, met with President Ferguson in support of this project. Um, so thank you all very much. Uh, we do have many long-term supporters uh, for this project and for junior achievement programs, um, including Kelly Schultz and the Comptroller Peter Francho. And I, I see many of uh, familiar faces from the Workforce Development Board to uh, some of our long-term donors and supporters of everything that we do. So uh, since we're short on time, I can't say hi to everyone, but we are asking for your support in the House and in the Senate to ensure that we can make this a reality. Um, I do do have my chairman, Mike Dunn, president and CEO of the Greater Salisbury Committee on here. So both of us are available to answer any questions. I hope that was quick and concise for you. That was absolutely great. And I think <laughs> we all, we'd all do, do, do know and appreciate you and your achievement. We appreciate all you're doing. I don't see any questions, but I'm glad you could make the meeting. Um, any questions for Jamie? All right, Jamie, thank you very much. And thanks to all of us. And I was going to say, Kristen, if you could forward those slides to uh, my office, I'll distribute them to the delegation. That would save you a, a whole lot of different emails. Um, okay, uh, moving right along. Uh, how about our federal delegation? Any quick comments or updates? I'll go. Um, <clears throat> It's refreshing to hear the acknowledgement from the Maryland ports about the federal funding that has come down um, for that project. And as an aside, you know, the state, those that IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, is bringing a lot of money to Maryland. It's going to your agencies. And as a direct result of individual outreach from Senator Cardin's office, um, my office did two webinars last week with nonprofits and the counties and municipalities about the congressionally directed spending request process. What we're hearing, uh, and you're gonna be seeing an uptick in phone calls from your constituents because they're gonna to wanna to be getting that IIJA funding that goes through your state agency. So if they don't, if it's not a good project for congressionally directed spending requests, we're referring them to your offices so that you can lobby on behalf of them. Um, so if you have any questions, be sure to follow up with us. And uh, always, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to give an update. Thank you. Um, good morning, my, Steve. It's Kimberly from Senator okay. Cardin's office. I would reiterate what Melissa said regarding the congressionally directed spending. Um, we have had multiple meetings with constituents from across the shore. Um, so we're you know, educating them on the FY23 process. Um, and, I, and also I would reiterate what she said about Mid-Bay and the port um, hearing the uh, excitement about the federal funding coming down. So um, we're available as always, reach out if you need anything. Okay, thank and you. Chairman Ernst, this is uh, sure. Mike Ernst. Um, the only thing I've got really is uh, all, many of you received uh, an email from me uh, day before yesterday, I believe, um, requesting a uh, response to a survey regarding midshore issues. Um, so for those of you who did receive that, if you could please respond, that's going to be extremely helpful uh, to providing some information for ongoing efforts on the shore. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I guess this closes our meeting for the week. Um, make sure you all look at next week's schedule. We'll get that calendar out to you just as soon as possible. Do appreciate everybody's attendance and good luck with the rest of the weekend. Thank you very much.